Hello, I'm your host, Peter Sajak, a professor of adult education on workplace learning at the University of Toronto. You're listening to Work, Learning, and Social Change, Foundational Voices, an informal discussion with some of the figures who have helped to define the field. In this episode, I'm speaking to Tara Fenwick, Professor Emeritus at the University of Stirling in Scotland, one of the leading voices of social materialist thought on professions, work, learning, and higher education. Here, we focus on the importance of research purpose and its impact on real-world change. Hello out there. Uh, welcome to our audience. Uh, our discussion series, if, you, if you've joined us before, if you've seen these uh, or heard this podcast or seen this video before, our discussion series is meant to be informal, uh, but I always try to begin with a few kind of prepared remarks uh, by way of introduction to our guest. Having worked at, a, at leading universities across Canada and having held visiting scholar posts around the globe, by 2010, Tara Fenwick would make the move to the University of Stirling in the UK. Where she, would where she would be a founder of a leading international research network, Propel, uh, very popular, still going today, the professional practice, education, and learning. I think it's learning, not leadership, but learning uh, a network. Uh, along with having published 90 journal articles, she's co-authored, uh, authored, co-authored, edited 18 books. I I've learned recently she was, she was writing a book right up to her last day of uh, retirement, uh, and she's now a uh, professor emeritus. At Sterling. Her latest of these being uh, uh, the final, I guess, ones. Well, maybe not the final ones. We'll find out, I guess, whatever. Uh, her latest of these being the collections Professional Learning in, Con in, in Changing Context in 2016 and Revisiting uh, Author, uh, Revisiting Actor Network Theory in Education 2018, both from Rutledge. Although my personal favorite is her uh, co edited. Uh, co-authored book emerging approaches to educational research <laughs> in 2011 that seems like ancient history ago but uh, along with uh, uh receiving her merited status at sterling uh tara's excellence has been uh, recognized uh by the american academy of human resource development and before that she received the prestigious Cyril o Hewell, uh, award for outstanding scholarship from the American Association for Adult and Continuing Education. She's a hugely popular uh, keynote speaker around the world. And in fact, the list of countries, it seems to me, the list of countries uh, that she hasn't been invited to speak in is actually shorter than the ones in which she has. Uh, I encountered her first through uh, way back when, about 20 years ago, through her careful explorations and critiques of experiential learning. Uh, and her development of critical perspectives on HRD. This was some time ago, but since then uh, has come her path setting work uh, on social material, materialist approaches to professions, work, learning, and education as a whole. Uh, and these have taken center stage. Tara, it's been a hugely long time. Um, uh, how are you? I just want to say great to see your face. How are you? I'm really well, Peter. Thank you for inviting me to this series. I'm really, really happy to take part. Yeah, I'm really happy you agreed to. I, I think I wrote to you in an email when I invited you. I said, I don't, I, I realize that the series just would have a, a glaring absence without ha speaking to you. Oh. So I'm so glad you did it. Um, okay, I'm going to just jump right into my first question here. Uh, and it's a broad one. And it's about what you think about your own work. But let me set it up this way. Uh, like across your careers, you've done a lot of empirical projects. Uh, you've explored lots of themes and you've actually explored and combined in, in many cases, many different types of theory. Uh, and today you're thinking, as I mentioned uh, earlier to the audience is it revolves, uh, my impression is involving around social materials approaches to work learning, education, and probably a number of other things. Uh, so my first impression is not uh, or my first question is not about my impressions of your work, but it's your impressions of your own work, which we aren't we aren't always asked about, and not, you know people sometimes you know talk about one's uh, uh, someone's work. I've had the experience from uh, every once in a while where someone talks about their my work, and I go, well, it's not that's not quite the way I think about it. So now is the time for you to tell us a little bit about uh, your thinking about social materialist approaches, perhaps, uh, other things you're thinking about and, and you've thought about, and, and what do you think makes you know, your approach distinct? Uh, what are its key kind of contributions to studies, especially of work and learning? Can, can you take a second to walk us through and some of those things? I know it's a broad question. Yeah, I guess maybe like others, I'm reluctant to apply the word distinct to what I may have done because 
I worked with so many people and was so inspired by so many people that it's not my particular contribution, but I want to just walk back and think through what for me is really important about this field that we're all in. Uh, work and learning or workplace learning, problematic term, but uh, all this work that we do, people come into it from radically different places. And I think that's important to look at and to recognize oneself. So I've met people who've come into this whose whole background profession was healthcare. They were physicians um, or whose whole background was working with trade unions or who work very much with social change communities on the ground in activism. Um, I, like many others, and just different from that because I came in from education itself and I very much always saw myself as an educator. I mean, I taught high school for years and I loved teaching and teaching in those kinds of environments. You are really focused on how do you help this learner in front of you who's really struggling to figure out what they're doing. You're not thinking about theories, you're thinking very, very practically about what on earth can we do to help this kid um, get, get a sense of, of how to go to the next stage. So I think that has pervaded a lot of how I've approached theory building, which mm -hmm. might sound a bit bizarre because I think pe some people have told me, oh, you're just a theorist. And I guess I've always seen myself as, yeah, the theory is a way to get to problematic term I know but what works you have to put the theory to work and for me the work is in education and I don't mean necessarily what we used to call formal education not necessarily education organized as education but development opportunities everything we do needs to be put to work in some way now I think a lot of us feel that but I remember being really surprised once listening to John Law who has affected my work a great deal uh, John Law wrote a lot about actor network theory and organizational kind of settings. And uh, it was a big conference all about object-based kinds of materiality and wonderful theories. And he stood up and he said, you know, the whole point is to develop a really good theory of this. <laughs> and somebody said, but what's the practical benefit? He said, we shouldn't be thinking about practice. Hmm. And I, I know he meant other things like the practice of theory is a practice, of course. But I guess at that point, I realized I'm really different than that. Because for me, the end point of all of this is actually helping people learn. And I'll come back to that, because I think there's a whole question about purposes. How, why are we helping these people learn this kind of curriculum or skill or what have you? Mm -hmm. So I, I think then turning from that, um, because of all my work with teaching in schools, I, I was always from the beginning focused on practice-based, what some call practice-based learning, what I called in the early years experiential learning, because to me, that was where it was all at. And I, I never needed to figure this out. It just was so endemic in me that knowledge and learning are produced through activity with particular materials and through particular political environments. It just was so common sense to me. It was a question of, well, mm. now how do we actually make this more visible? Mm. And maybe part of that came from the fact that I, I think I told you I started my work life as a musician. I was a pianist for mm -hmm. years and a, a pianist learns through doing and hearing and, and the material of the instrument and so on. So through my interest in practice-based learning, I think my whole career was just learning other ways of looking at this notion of activity and practice and learning within that. So eventually I became involved, as you mentioned briefly, um, with something that's loosely called socio-material approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'll just define it briefly in terms of how I think about that, because it's a broad school, a broad yeah. field. So very simply, I think we can say social is about meanings, uh, discourses, politics, and materials are tools and bodies and technologies. And we could say environments, but environments are coagulations of social material. 
and the social elements and material elements are not really distinct. They co-produce each other, but together they bring forth particular knowledges, particular activities, particular political relations. And I think there's lots to say about how do you bring that into the workplace where you are in a, in a fundamentally political environment. And that's the critique people make about the social materialism. Well, that's all very nice, but when you're in environments that have clear oppressions and hierarchies and all this kind of thing, how does this kind of approach speak to that? So I spent a lot of my later years really grappling with that. Well, I don't think it was a grappling. Bruno Latour has a really nice way of looking at how that helps us understand politics more than, than sometimes grander narratives help. But anyway, I was in all of this really always trying to draw attention to the materiality piece because it seems to get dropped so easily. Mm. Um, I, I drop it myself. It's very easy when you're in a theoretical way of being and talking and discourse to forget the body that that all this is working through and, and the, the very materials, the tools, and the technologies. So I was always trying to make that very, very visible. And for some reason, that was something that people that I spoke, you know, in keynotes or whatever to, people would say, oh yeah. <laughs> Even people whose whole life is working with instruments, like working with healthcare workers and so on, instruments and bacteria and all the rest of it. Yeah. And they they know implicitly that their whole environment is material. But when you get them talking very explicitly about how that then produces the knowledge that they take for granted and their bodies produce that mm. uh, along with patients' bodies, it, it for me, was really exciting kinds of conversations I got into. Yeah, can I just follow up something there? Because I've I've read uh, you um, on this question. You you mentioned the kind of um, well, you 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 packaged it quick, quickly there. The uh, the inherent kind of critique, a uh, political, economic, uh, social critique, in um, a kind of uh, like you said, a broad set of uh, umbrella uh, an umbrella term for the social materialism but it, well in terms of actor network theory uh, in in this case in particular um there is an inherent critique of it because things is it right to say that things have politics politics are things too uh are they're part of the political um overall assembly of moving parts and co-productions uh, am i summarizing that adequately or how would you yeah. correct that there's a real well, politics and critique available vis-a-vis -vis this, what seems like a very, a very disciplined uh, set of, of tools for thinking about these complex uh, situations. Uh, correct any of that? Or, or what, what, does that ring true for you at all in terms of this inherent? Or could you speak a little bit more about the inherent criti critical aspects of politics and, and economic conflicts and cooperations uh, there a little bit? Well, I guess I'm thinking when I say critique of, let's say, actor network theory or social material or complexity, which is another emergence mm -hmm. way of looking at how things and subjectivities co-produce each other. I hate to use these kind of jargony terms, but I haven't got time to find better language. I'm sorry. Um, the critique seems to be that you can't address power relations when you're talking at that micro level. And Bruno Latour says, and Bruno Latour uh, is only one of many wonderful writers in this vein. And I, I won't go into them now, but I was wonderfully inspired by lots of writers who came after him and built on and expanded and, ex and enriched the kinds of things he originally said. So in some of his early work, I'm talking in the nineties now, some of these things he wrote that objects are political locations. Mm. Um, they induce particular ways of acting and thinking. And then he goes on to say an object is always an assemblage to use that sort of loaded term. But all he was trying to say is 
nothing can be taken for granted for what you see in front of you. It was put together through a whole set of, I hate to use the word micro because it implies that there's a macro and the macro is more important and more generalized. But he said at that tiny level, there's all of these negotiations. Mm. And so a table is put together, as we know, in workplaces through all sorts of, of material and political kinds of processes. But every one of those can be broken down to a set of negotiations that at some time in the past became black boxed, to use a, a, a simplistic kind of metaphor, held together and then taken for granted. It then moved around and mm. people didn't question how it moved. How uh, how did uh, Uber come about? How is Deliveroo done? And it just becomes accepted after a while. And all the new, yeah, everybody knows that there's all sorts of problems with that, but that has become black box. Mm. And at some point in the past, those were important political negotiations. Every one of those, not just between people, but among all the objects involved. And, mm. and at some point they solidify. And once they do, all sorts of other forces begin holding that mm. solidification in place. And then those forces become part of, and that's how he picked apart mm. in a way, when we say power relations, because he comes out of Foucault, he, he comes out of that French tradition and, and all of these writers were working from that Foucauldian and, and other uh, work um, in looking at power. How is it actually put together? And that's what he came up with. And that to me made a lot of sense. So that's, I guess, how I resolved it for myself. And mm -hmm. then we all have to make choices in what, <laughs> what lane you're going to move in, as you put it earlier in our conversation, what lane will your own career take? And I decide, well, I don't want to keep defending the politics of this. I would rather make it work. How does, how do you put these ideas to work towards learning and towards workplace development and, and uh, uh, developing conditions in the workplace that are more educative and towards a better higher education for professions. That's what I ended up focusing on. Yeah. Does that help? Oh, no, I, I, I see it's really helpful. The, um, I mean, in the traditions that I work from mostly, uh, we kind of try to take on some of these things that when you talked about how um, our, the term from the traditions I work from, we've called kind of the reified, the thing, the thingification of something, all the minutia of the negotiations and choice making and the politics of all that and the power of all that. Uh, mm -hmm. No, I think you summarize it really well. And then something like Actor Network there has a way of taking that and, and really showing how it happens and unfolds. Can I just ask you another thing, though, because people are always interested to know what the distinctions are uh, that surround the, these key terms. Um, uh, like becoming an emergent stand out for me. Students talk about it in my courses. We have some readings on it and uh, they, they really are attracted to these kind of ideas. And you mentioned emergence um, in, in, by way of explanation, but can you speak a little bit more about that and its relationship to your, you know, the social materialist uh, kind of thinking and, 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 and uh, com maybe complexity theory as well? Do you have, you have oh, that? In, this it is time such to do that? A, a big question. Um, How's it different from, say, transformation in the conventional usage? You mean in terms of transformative learning, say, models yeah. and sure. theories, or any other kind of uh, it's kind yeah. of simplistic or, or commonsensical kind of ways of addressing change? Maybe I don't know, but emergence and becoming are very different. I think I think there's a distinction there that students really and me too are attracted to because it's 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 highlighting something a little bit. Well, can you speak to it? Because you use the term. It's in the title of one of your books, at least one. <laughs> you got me there. Um, becoming is a tricky one because it's associated with so many other important theoretical ideas. Um, Deleuzian kinds of ideas is what first comes to mind. And the emergence piece I use for, for me, obviously these words can be used in any way somebody wants and defined in any way that makes sense to them. Emergence I take from its complexity understanding. And I learned to use the word emergence in this way through Brent Davis, who really inspired me early on um, 
because he was bringing complexity science. The guy's a mathematician and a mathematics educator. And he was bringing the ideas of complexity science into education. And mm. I really liked the way he tried to um, not cheat these scientific ideas or in any way anthropomorphize them, if you like, because complexity mm. ideas uh, come out of uh, biological evolution and so on. But, and so he was very much trying to avoid the problem that some, um, I suppose, social sciences have fallen into of taking these complexity emergence ideas from biology and just slapping them onto sociopolitical sy systems, leaving out all sorts of important uh, differences between those systems. So he tried very hard to navigate that to say, what can this show us about learning? But he uses emergence as it is about the uh, the system coming into being and how these, let's call them, he doesn't use the term socio and material, but let's call them these various elements of the system uh, come together and emerge in particular ways, particular patterns that we can track and that can be influenced and that if particular conditions are present, they can emerge in very productive ways. And in other kinds of um, more restrictive conditions, they can emerge in ways that we might find really problematic in human systems. Mm -hmm. So I use that word emergence particularly to talk about this kind of a, almost a scientific um, interplay of elements in a, in a systemic um, set of configurations. That's a really jargony. I just listened to myself way of saying it. It's, <laughs> I almost would say we need to go back to some of the writing where I can write it out in detail and put some examples in and so on. Yeah. Becoming to me a word that came more out of people very concerned and um, preoccupied with human subjectivities. And mm. so where is the human uh, growth is a word that is problematic and complexity. Um, but in a human sense and educational sense, we think we know what growth means very clearly. So becoming mm. to me is very tied in with that. One of the issues I think that I still grappled with, but I kind of papered over it to get on with how do we use these ideas to actually help improve education and, and learning uh, development hmm. is how do you marry the whole questions of human subjectivity and affect and all of these with these other ideas that come more out of systems and so on. Some have said, well, it's not a problem because human subjectivity is part of the system. Others mm. have said subjectivity is its own system. Others have said to even talk about it that way is to create a binary which doesn't exist. So I think we all have to resolve it for ourselves uh, by working through and by being propelled towards mm. what what is your goal here? Why, wh what is this question helping you to do? Um, if it's just to solve that question, then yeah, you're going to spend a lot of theoretical time. But if you're trying to figure out, so where do we go with this in whatever you're mm -hmm. trying to do, whether it's uh, politicize workers or create more fair and equitable workplaces mm -hmm. or improve organizational development, we have to be really careful because lots of people use these emergent ideas and their goal is organizational development to make more efficient and productive organizations, which mm -hmm. is perfectly legitimate. But if my own goal is, let's say, to improve higher education so that we can have much more relevant um, pre-professional education for healthcare workers and social care and so on, then these other mm. people's ways of talking about these ideas aren't necessarily helpful. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think, but we're, I am too, and you particularly so, um, uh, but I mean, you're drawn to ideas because they're solving, uh, which is, I guess, another way of just paraphrasing maybe what you just said, because they're solving problems for it. It seems like just an inside baseball or a, a very, um, a very 
you know, a closed world of, of thinking and debate, these details of the, the difference between these terms. And certainly in kind of, you know, uh, uh, just everyday speech, they don't have these distinctions. But when it when the distinctions of some of these key ideas make a difference to how you're going to be able to get at what you're aiming to do, especially if it's uh, in the world of concrete change and, and things of this, the, the distinctions are, are sometimes worth fighting over uh, and, it, and, and getting just right, maybe. Yeah. For, for oneself, I would say, yeah, yeah. Uh, and one's colleagues. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I think I obsessed over a little when I was still supervising PhD theses is when students would get um, very excited by very different schools of thought and say, well, I'll just put them both together. And it, there was always this kind of internal wrench where you wanted to celebrate somebody's ingenuity and uh, intellectual excitement with this notion that this is like a terrible clash. It's not even an exciting clash. These ideas cancel each other out at a certain point. So working these out in a way that at least bridges and not trying to put so many ideas together. I think that's the other thing. In many ways, Peter, I think a lot of these different theories of thought, theories of thought, <laughs> theories of understanding learning and work are all looking at the same kind of phenomena. Imagine a bunch of strings floating around in this dynamic space, and each of them are shining a light in a different way on the mm. same phenomena. They've got a hold of the same issues but they're coming into it with either different traditions or different emphases, different priorities. So they, in some ways are talking about the same thing, but in very different kinds of ways. So the more one reads, the more one thinks, oh, I should include that theory now too, because it's really exciting. Well, just yeah. choose one. <laughs> and do it well, yeah. And, and one that makes sense to you mm. and, and, and Use that, maybe uh, using another one. I'm just going to turn off my phone, sorry. Using another one to extend it a little bit or enrich it in a way, but sit with it. And if you want to expand it and extend it yourself, by all means, be careful to do it according to what it is you're trying to accomplish in your research. To me, it's always going back to what is your material context of research? What is mm. it? What is the question here? What, what are you trying to work towards? Yeah, and, and I think it's related to this because one of the things I've quoted back to students uh, and other people have said this probably about their own kind of thinking and kind of theory, theoretical approach, uh, but the idea that a theory is not a formula to be followed. Uh, it, it's not, it's not a, a, especially if it's not like a recipe card. Uh, and so I'm, I'm carrying out my research and I have this uh, uh, theory so I could just follow what it says to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's nice to have models to follow in a sense or to inspire and to maybe to mimic, to find differences. But you've, you've specifically written about people when they've asked you about, you know, applying some of the uh, theories, actor network theory, but and others as well, that it's not, I think just actor network theory, you might've written about this, uh, that it's not necessary. It, you can't think of it as just a formula to be followed, a recipe card, Sam. I think you said formula, but uh, can you just speak a little bit to that? that that you have to bring it alive in some way what what exactly is your warning there well maybe to students or maybe other researchers i'm trying to think about this now at a distance which is always interesting right when you look right. back not only on what was it i was meaning but also and what do i think now so there's a couple of of things happening in my head right now but I think anything that is picked up and used without thinking it through for oneself is not asking enough critical question about what's in front of you. And one of the things that I'm becoming more and more aware of that we need, and I'm really worried about its loss, is a natural tendency of scholars, it used to be, or maybe it still is, but I'm not seeing as much of it, to critically question everything in front of them um, and to speak up about 
what what makes sense here, but what doesn't make sense when I've given it my full engagement and made a lot of effort to figure out what this author is saying. And at some point, there may be things that I'm saying, this doesn't fit the context I'm looking at, or there's something missing here, or there's some wrongheadedness here. Mm. If we pick up anything and simply apply it, we're not stopping to first ask, to what extent does this really make sense to me? I'm the future researcher. This stuff was written a few years ago in very different contexts. Is it still relevant? If not, what do it, what things do I know about in my own life that this writer can't possibly have anticipated that I can now make sense of uh, in working with this theory in a different way. In other words, it's not applying in a formulaic sense. It's always working it through and working it through critically. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, I'm trying to walk a fine line of, of mm. the tendency some of us have. I do when I pick up something I don't understand at all, as I just set it aside. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> sure. I don't need to understand it. But if something grabs you and then you you get to parts that are difficult, if you set it aside, then you're not giving it full due. But if it attracts you, work it through, work it through, work it through, and then step back and, and be quite critical. But I want to come back to criticality, Peter, at some mm. point, because I'm becoming in my old age really, really troubled by this issue in the context of all the disinformation of our current society. And I think especially in universities, if we in any way have a condition where students feel they need to pick up this author because they were told it's a good one or use this theory because it's um, trust the theory the you know, the people who developed are great. You don't know enough, just use it. Uh, I feel we are simply contributing to more and more of a passive complicity acceptance of whatever mm. tribe you're in uh, and its own theories. Yeah, it's a, and, it's a you know, culture. My, yeah. It's a it's the cultural thing now, the tribal alliances and so on. But I would just want to go back to when you asked me where you know my my influences and stuff were. Um, one of the the first influences for me was in experiential learning, reading people who were asking really critical questions about um, what is given, and Alana Mickelson was never really celebrated as an author, but her articles on experiential learning early on, she was writing, uh, she was showing real problems with prior learning assessment in ways others weren't at the time. And she questioned what does experience mean and what happens when experience becomes commodified as human capital and how is gender important in these issues? That was early, early on. And then she's gone on to write books, but her and then Barbara Townley was the first person in HRD, and now critical HRD is everywhere. Barbara Townley, 1994, who wrote this whole critique of HRD practices, just asking questions like, why is it that we do performance evaluations without asking really big questions about who's doing the evaluating for what purpose? You know, and she used Foucault. Those kinds of writers were the ones that had the biggest effect on me, people who asked questions about orthodoxies. And as you know, in mm -hmm. the workplace, orthodoxies get taken up really quick because they get commodified and sold as mm -hmm. new training approaches. I think the one that made me craziest was the learning organization. That was one of my right. first big critiques right. yeah. because it was being handed around as a manifesto and, and I was in workplaces at the time I was working with government and so on in, in education and we were being called into these you know two-day workshops and handed a copy of Peter Senge's The Learning Organization and told this is what we're going to be read it and we're all going to be this wonderful emergent kind of place that's one of the mm. areas where complexity theory got used in a very uh, particular perhaps narrow way but that questioning is what I would promote for our students. Now, any theory they come across, start at it with what questions does it help me to work through? How would I put it to work? And what's not here? What are its preoccupations that don't make that much sense to me? 
that kind of thing. Not to critique the theory, but to figure out how to work with that theory in ways that are productive for your research. Right. Well, well and to your, your one of your original consistent points earlier, which is what are you trying to do? Uh, mm -hmm. That's often, most often going to be quite distinct from what another author was trying to do. Yeah. Uh, and so hence, it, it, it's, it can, just can't be a formula uh, to go back to that other thing I mentioned. But it also uh, kind of encouraged people to think uh, very groundedly and critically about what they're trying to do with this uh, body uh, toolbox um, yeah. and trying to get done with it. Is it the right toolbox for what I want to do? Yeah. Um, yeah, rather than the, I know the kind of culture of a kind of theoretical tribalism in a way. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, there can be these kind of strong clusters that emerge uh, in every field, uh, but they have a, a, a kind of a, a, a gravitational pull of their own. And I think students um, need to be assisted in finding which universe they want to be in and, and straddling universes or something. Yeah, it is challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just on that, I think we all have seen this in other disciplines as well, where you have these very clear theoretical groups that then sometimes very aggressively defend their own principles. And there's antagonisms that develop. And in all of this, you're thinking, especially now that I'm kind of outside it, and I'm looking at this is what we're seeing everywhere. If we look at social media and all the antagonistic tribes that, that get developed, and I don't think it's too far out of the question to say academic environments have their own share of that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. where you've got the theoreticians that aren't terribly excited about working with practitioners and the clinicians that are saying, well, but, you know, they, they're they they're treating us as though we don't know anything, but in fact, they don't know anything about practice. And then you've got the, the chat people and the practice-based people. Nick Hopwood and I used to laugh about this. We, mm, we ah, just did. We, we, I didn't hear we, we just laughed about it, yeah. <laughs> but, but he and I used to, you know, kid each other. One of the funniest things he ever did was at one of the conferences he did, did a whole presentation where he set up a sort of a spoof of a, of a big... Star Wars. Par par paradistic war, yeah, between uh, those who are talking practice-based, you know, with all of its notion of bundles and all this, and those who are talking socio-material with all the rejection of all that. And all of that is to say that that's the human tendency. And as you say, when you get tribes, you get gravitational pull, and then you get a, a, a sort of a serious need to defend the boundaries and all that. Instead of listening mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and thinking through in this world where in the academy, we all very glibly say, oh, we collaborate. We value collaboration. And look at all the ways we collaborate with communities. We collaborate with practitioners. We collaborate in across disciplines. But when you look at the collaboration, and everybody talks about this, it, it boils down to all these micro politics. Instead of going back to, and this is one thing, that if I had students now, I would really be emphasizing critical questioning and listening, listening, really listening to what the others are saying, instead of thinking, what's the repost to that? <laughs> How right. do we attack that point? And then build bridges. It's an old metaphor. I don't know if it works, but are there ways of understanding how the others are thinking? You don't have to use those other ways, but at least to understand like you're asking how do we understand the difference between people who are talking about becoming and those of us talking about emergence or other way around those mm -hmm. guys talking about emergence those of us interested in becoming what really are the differences and uh where do we see things similarly and how do their preoccupations help to illuminate certain aspects of this phenomena of mm. work or or of cognition or of affect in the work that we're also trying to what what do their points of view illuminate that to me is that whole listening collaboration understanding tribal boundedness and this i don't know current contextual pull to more and more antagonistic that to me is a critical piece for young academics 
Yeah, and it's tough uh, to, and for middle age and, and, and aging ones, it's tough to stay out of the, the, the mire of that sometimes. And I've often found myself having kind of feeling like I have no home because there's a phrase that I, I just used with somebody and somebody wrote something. I think it might have been about me. But anyways, <laughs> but it was like a kind of, it says open mindedness. And it, it, but the way it was phrased, I was kind of being accused of being open minded. <laughs> and so, like I said to uh, in an earlier interview in the series, I said, I said, oh, in the in the kind of vein we're talking about, kind of non tribalistic, but just again, it, with, with the kind of um, intention just to learn and understand things uh, that that you've been accused of being open minded, you know, like that that's actually a kind of a, a, a problem in, uh, in in kind of theoretical or academic or work or research in, in all sorts of ways, like that, that that actually is a barrier to doing it somehow. And it's, so it's an accusation rather than a compliment. Anyways, uh, and I, I would say the same thing. And this is just, again, my impression that you are willing to go and read and listen in ways you've kind of demonstrated more so than than other people I know, including myself, to read and follow tracks and try to understand what we're being done uh, down, uh, uh, you know, down different pathways with different people, which you've never stayed stagnant with you. Uh, I, I really I mean that, honestly, I've, I've seen you move and I still have on my reading list some of your older work, you know, like 25 years ago, well, 20, 22, whatever, some of you, that, that still remains as, as kind of supplementary readings for certain areas of, of the teaching that I do even though you kind of pop to center stage for other areas of teaching I do your work anyways. Uh, but anyways, um, I want to say uh, thank you for taking us back to uh, some of those kind of uh, authors who were so uh, quite critical, uh, Lana Mickelson, for instance, but um, uh, because that's important for students to know too. Anyways, I want to go on to another question here, which is things you haven't done and you wondered about doing you know, whether it's a theory or an author that you've been meaning to, I can, I could, if I could turn the camera around, I can show you that there's a portion of my books on my shelves here that I have, and I fully intend to read, and I know they're important to read, but I've never read them. There are methods that I kind of always wondered about. Uh, I've always been fascinated by something called time use studies, and how to really marry, ah. <laughs> marry, and marry that with, with a kind of a, a deeply theorized kind of lifelong life course learning and activity systems and all that kind of stuff. But have, do you have anything that's kind of in the back of your mind there, or even that you know you might not get to, uh, but that you kind of had wondered about putting to use and you never did, but you had some thing that you always wondered about using, whether it's a method or a theory or something like that? Yeah, lots, oh. I think. But uh, one that I will never be able to do, I I don't know if I could have done it in my career. I always wanted to do a full-on, full-scale ethnography, a real ethnography, mm -hmm. the kind we used to read about, you know, where somebody wrote a book after being in situ for a year. Yeah. And that kind of luxury, that kind of money, that kind of time. I mean, uh, I suppose if I'd agreed to give up my academic salary for a year and just self-funded and gone off, I could have done it. But then there were all the ethics of negotiating entry into a community. And, and I, I, I just early on decided I'm not ever gonna be able to do this. And then really, as you I'm sure do as well, along with our colleagues, caution students who say, oh, I've done an ethnography because I visited yeah. a classroom one day a week for three weeks. And you just say, you know what? Don't even go anywhere near the term <laughs> because it is, I've always thought it would be such a rich and difficult ethically and difficult socially and energetically everything. But I always thought that would have such a potential, not, not just for the knowledge one would engage in, and bring forth, but what it would do to you as a researcher, the kinds of changes one would go through uh, being immersed like that. So I've, I've always enjoyed reading those full on ethnographies, like Barbara Ehrenreich, you know, how she did those, where she'd go into a yeah. workplace for like three or four weeks, uh, three or four months undercover. And you think, oh, God, I, I would just, love to do I don't have the energy anymore to do that kind of thing either but um that 
that's one of those that I just set aside early on and always thought, yep, that would be a dream someday. Come back as an ethnographer. But, but, but <laughs> do you anticipate what kind of things would be uh, available to you vis-a-vis -vis that that you haven't already I, I agree that there's there would be new things available but what in your mind would be available to your thinking then uh you know kind of very different experience of data well very different data uh yeah. a year long you know life in a you know uh some sort of institution yeah. but like what your gut feeling says that it would take your you, you'll be able to answer, you know, additional layers of questions. Can you yeah. think of an example of when you've done your own research and you said, well, I can't really get that far with this, but if it was yeah. an ethnography, then I could do, I would know a little bit more about, I suspect I would know a little bit more about this, this, and this. So from a social materialist, broadly speaking perspective, I, I can imagine ethnography being really important. So, but what can you imagine kind of getting, what nuggets would you, would you kind of, mine out of the situation vis-a-vis -vis ethnography versus how you've always done things well as you say this is highly speculative i yeah. don't know but yeah. from the ethnographies i've read i think it would be about getting at the meanings of these socio-material relations for want of a better term but all these objects and texts and these tools and these ways of relating those in activities to get at much more the sense of how that's working, how these things can, in other words, to be able to get the kind of perspective one really can't get on one's own, mm. you know, you're, you're the fish in the water kind of thing. It's very, very hard to really see critically at your own stuff, but in a very different kind of community, Mm. anything that's different from your experience if you're there long enough from what i gather from ethnographies it takes a long time before you can actually begin to get past your own meanings that you in immediately impose on things that you see when you walk in mm. to begin to see and sometimes never see and of course there's all kinds of problems with that of who's doing the seeing and how's it being interpreted at the end you're never going to get to some kind of a basal truth mm. but at least you're going to get past or even maybe get a better sense of how you as researchers see mm. and what you can't see. It just always struck me that that would be a, a profound change, a yeah, profound I, learning. I, I totally agree with you. And and and, and this the ethnographies uh, from uh, Nick uh, Hopwood's version of, of of kind of things at times the spaces. Bodies and Things uh, was yeah. one of the subtitles of his one of his books a while back, maybe not too long ago. Uh, and he he's one of those one of those uh, people who who organizes financial, uh, you know, kind of grants and awards and life and stuff and organizes in such a way that he yeah. can actually do like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours across all these different ethnographies. So, and that's, I think, the deal is. Mm. Um, you, you do have to be separated, I believe, to, mm. to do this kind of work from ethnographies I've read, from other academic kinds of obligations to be really immersive. Yeah. So that you are making thousands of observations and constantly questioning and reflecting. At least I can't imagine myself keeping teaching and everything else no. going at the same time as you're trying to make sense of so many things on so many levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I agree. Um, it's so funny though that I said I spoke to essentially a quantitative survey method uh, of a type, uh, the time you thing, and you spoke to something very deeply humanized. So maybe that says something about, <laughs> anyways. But you know, it's that's ridiculous. But maybe I'll edit that part out, uh, or my suggest my example. I think I'll edit that out. Uh, anyways, um, there's a very important um, uh, issue I want to get to, and I'm conscious of your time, and we've we've touched on a little bit about like the kind of um uh, you've done a great deal of supervision. Uh, a graduate thesis and you've worked with a lot of students taught for many many years at multiple levels of education system so the, this important question i take seriously is, is advice that you would have upon reflection of a, of a rich and, and lengthy career in doing so multiple careers what advice would you have to to students especially kind of doctoral level students but perhaps it, it, it folds over into uh, researchers that are new to the field of workplace learning uh, but what kind of advice do you, do you have? One or two bits of piece of advice we can give, you can give to students that uh, might be watching this. Gosh, um, 
You touched on that important term. What is tempted to say? Don't take advice from anybody whose own years of emergence were 25 years ago, like mine. But oh, no. um, because I'm an educator, you just can't help but give advice, can you? I, I, I find if somebody said, what advice would you give? Oh, I'm ready to jump in and give all kinds of advice. So, <laughs> um, so with that caveat, I would say um, one of the big issues is, I kept saying, is purpose. Figure out what purpose, what, why are you looking at this particular question? Mm. And yes, it would be nice to always say, well, because the deeper research trajectory that I'm trying to develop is about looking at AI and professional work, but maybe you can't get the money to get started on that. It's okay to know that your purpose in this particular study is to do a survey of vocational trends because you want to get a publication that will help you move towards this other purpose. Know what your purpose is if mm. you don't and what your purpose is you'd like them to be. Because if you don't, you get, it's so easy to get pulled into other people's purposes. And mm. before you know it, you're picking up projects based on opportunity. Mm. Um, what, what's easy, what's close by, what, what is local, who's invited you into this project. Um, and it all looks very fun. And, you know, I think some might argue there's a real value in that. I would say, yes, there is, as long as you know what your purpose is, what are you, why mm. are you studying this? Is it because you really want to improve organizations? Is it really because you want to improve higher education for, for a lot of professions, um, which is where I ended up, my purpose changed through my career. Yeah. And my last um, seven years, for sure, were all about higher education for professions and understanding practice. Um, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by all the choices, right? Oh, I mm. want to help workplaces be more green. And I want to make them more equitable. And I want to work on higher education. And I'm interested in decolonizing workplaces mm -hmm. i think one needs to i hate to say focused but mm -hmm. i think you can only do so much in your career and i think knowing early on or trying to get a sense of what really excites you and what particular experiences and competences do you bring that could move into a particular purpose and work with that and i think part of that is really scanning outside of the received questions to because you go to conferences and, and a student can walk away with oh the questions I need to work on are mm. x y and z I think it's really useful to step outside that and look from the outside of the academy at what are the questions you you're really excited by in work learning research um, you know all the changes we've had in work right now and uh, the whole question of in a Canadian perspective which Canadians won't hear at the international conferences, which is other than Australian ones, is how do we decolonize workplaces and how do we decolonize learning and work learning? Mm. What might reconciliation look like in work learning? I mean, that's a, a mm -hmm. Canadian set of questions. Um, the, all the questions about how have work, how has work really changed through uh, pandemic lockdowns and how do we make sense of workplace learning now when there's huge hiring shortages and nobody has money to spend, you know, with the gig economy, that like there's so many issues, AI, the social media antagonisms, what questions emerge for people that really excite them about work and learning. And then always the supervisor helps move that into a question that has long-term implications and helps. But through that, the students always thinking, mm. What, what purpose have I got here? What, I'm interested in that, but what purpose have I got for studying the work and learning piece of that? Mm -hmm. and, and keeping that level of excitement up because you're going to have to do it for a bit of a haul. You better, it better cut pretty close to where your real passion is. I don't like yeah. that phrase so much, but it better have energy for you. Uh, well, so the, better be close to what you're really interested in. Yeah, sorry. I, I, no, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with you, Peter. And that's a better way of saying what I would have called something like strategy that young researchers, and now I guess I'm talking about early career researchers in post. Uh, what I saw happening over and over again is exploitation, to be fair. 
young researchers being drawn into opportunities, which are a lot of admin work. Organizations like universities are always <laughs> trying to find someone to do the dishes. And young researchers get caught up in that very quickly. Um, they're sometimes promised that, oh, it'll, you know, it, it'll be really citizenship, it'll be really good for your tenure. And I'm not saying we shouldn't all do our bits, but I do see some of that being loaded onto young. So be, being strategic about what to give to the organization, but also about what research opportunities to take up. Mm. Don't just fall for what's close. Don't just fall for somebody who's big in the field has approached you to be part of their research, unless this is part of your purpose or you can see it being part of your purpose. Go seek out who's doing work you really like and mm. uh, you know, approach them. It's that whole thing about within the, to the extent you can in today's embattled academies, or wherever a researcher ends up in in government in a in organization, um, try to hold on to what your own vision of where you want to be going is, and ask yourself about everything that comes up. Am I doing this because I have to, uh, or is this really helping me to get mm. where I'm going? Yeah, and to be have that level of awareness of where you want to go so that you can marry it to other opportunities and you can seize things and collaborate. Uh, yeah, I think there's a really good, important words of advice, not just for uh, students, doctoral students say, but also for um, uh, career <laughs> career academics uh, early or, or mid, you know, it can hit you at all sorts of times. Be a good citizen and uh uh, you know, get drawn away or, or drawn into things for quite, not quite the right reasons. Yeah, I don't know. Well, but, and I think one thing I wish I'd done earlier in my own career is ask other people. When you get an opportunity, like somebody says, oh, um, you should coordinate the next conference. It'll be great for your career. Think of all the networking you'll do. I mean, or or you should edit the book review section of this journal for the next three years. And instead of asking other people that you trust, like, is this a really good thing to do? Is this a good thing to do now in my career? What are the advantages and disadvantages of doing this now? We tend to be very isolated sometimes and maybe a bit reluctant to ask advice of other colleagues. And I wished I'd done more of that about these opportunities that come mm. up. Mm. Mm -hmm. But I think that the, with that, I want to go back to a, a final thing that mm. I am so keen about now, Peter, especially since I've stepped away from the academy, mm -hmm. is asking the difficult questions, asking critical questions, interrupting what is orthodoxy, not being afraid to put up one's hand and saying, but what I don't see here is maybe mm. I'm missing it, but can you help me see what, because this to me is an important piece of thinking deeply about things and figuring out what it is you see as truth and, and not being afraid to ask, no matter how important the person is or Oh, you know, this in academic importance, there are all these academic hierarchies that don't get questioned a lot. Mm -hmm. And asking those hard questions. Um, it, I think I'm affected by this particularly because of reading a lot recently about cancel culture and mm -hmm. what people call social censure. And I was just listening to the BBC Reith lecture, R-E-I-T-H. And if any student wants a real injection of inspiration. That is a good one. It's the first one of 2022, and it featured the author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, um, who wrote Americana, as well as many other books. And she wrote about, she talked about free speech. And she addressed this very thing that has been really bothering me. And she actually said, I, because she teaches as well. Mm -hmm. She said, I see a drop in a willingness to speak out, a willingness to ask critical questions, a willingness to say the uncomfortable things. I see a drop in that. And I thought, gosh, I wonder if that's true mm. in the academy. I mean, you would know better than I, but I certainly see a drop in it in broader social situations. People not so willing to call out things that are really problematic, 
misinformation. People got very used to tolerating completely false and inaccurate things said in a social situation mm. rather than, and I, and you see it on social media as well. And people worried about speaking out and being, count anyway, that's moving into a slightly different thing, but mm. I do believe the Academy is not immune from these influences. I mean, we see it certainly with the whole gender critical feminist issues and, and race issues and so on. So I think that's the thing I would hope to keep helping students strengthen is the courage to speak up, interrupt, ask questions that maybe others aren't asking, maybe because it hasn't occurred to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's not immune, like you said. Um, it's a uh, it's an intensified um, microcosm of the world in some ways, uh, mm -hmm. in certain ways, uh, and it's an important point to raise. Uh, these are all things that have to be navigated, um, and I think when you're newer to the field or, or student or early career person, then uh, yeah, you you really should reach out for advice and mentoring, like. Um, I benefited from a lot of mentors. You, you must have benefited from some mentors in your career as well. But mentor mentorship, um, and even co student to student mentorship, I've seen is very effective. Um, you know, two doctoral students kind of kind of hold each other up collaboratively in a way, and and they you know one will know something, the other one won't know, and yeah, um, you know, because you don't know what you don't know, and that's where a mentor really comes in, or at least a a colleague and a support uh, for yourself, but. Okay. Definitely small yeah. groups of students yeah. working together, studying together. I mean, you've promoted that all your career. I've promoted that. It's very powerful. And those relationships often track with them through their academic careers. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, um, this has been a lengthy and very enjoyable uh, time. People uh, in the audience wouldn't know that we talked for a little bit even beforehand. So I've kept People in the audience out there, I've kept Tara for quite a while now, and I want to thank her uh, for uh, meeting up and talking about and, and covering so much ground. Uh, it's really been helpful. I know people will get a lot from it. And unless there's something else you want to say, uh, I'll, I'll maybe bring us to a close. Just to say thanks again, Peter. I haven't had a chance to talk like this in a long time. I'm sorry if I overstayed my welcome, but it's no. been a real treat. No, 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 no. I, I actually think I want to think of a part two to, to discuss some things with you about this. But anyways, uh, no, but it's fine. I, I uh, it's not it's more than fine. It's excellent. And I think there's just lots of stuff that people will mine and get uh, out of this, uh, being able to listen or watch or, or both. Uh, and uh, so thank you again. It's great seeing you. Uh, I've been way too long and looking forward to getting together at some point. Um, anyways, I'll say goodbye then. Thanks, Peter. Goodbye. Okay, goodbye. Thank you.